Hi again, welcome back. Today we're going to be in chapter nine, which is all about the family after birth. The postpartum period is also known as the purpurium. It's the six weeks that follow childbirth. Um, some people refer to it as the fourth semester. Um, of course, just with as with everything else that we've talked about, we're always going to take into account um, different cultures and beliefs that might circle around um, any time patients are in your care, and it's no different uh, when they're in the postpartum period. We do need to have special considerations for um, specific groups of patients, such as adolescents, single women, families that are at or below the poverty level, and families who have had more than one baby. Um, so these groups of patients might um, cause you to need to adapt more um, things, more more teaching um, to their particular situation. It's not always going to be cookie cutter. As far as cultural influences on the postpartum period, um, we need to make sure that we're adapting our care to fit the different health beliefs, values, and practices. Um, when we don't speak their language, it's really important to have an interpreter so that what we're trying to convey um, when we're trying to educate doesn't get lost in translation, but that um, we're using an interpreter that speaks their dialect and um, they can understand. A lot of times we um, are now using iPads where the interpreter can be seen, not just heard through a phone. Um, and that enables us to give her the optimal care and education she needs so that, like I said, there's not anything lost in translation. And when we can, we need to use an interpreter that's not a family member um, so that in case of things that might be embarrassing to talk about um, that um, education education doesn't get skewed at all. So there's a lot of changes that happen right after delivery. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how everything kind of just has to readjust back to its pre-pregnancy state. Um, so immediately after delivery, she's going to experience multiple physiological changes, and it's important for us to not just focus on the reproductive system changes, but realize that everything that we talked about that changes during pregnancy now is going to have to go back to a pre-pregnancy state. So we're going to look at all the different systems, um, including the reproductive system. Um, and we're just going to kind of talk about the way that things will change after she delivers. So speaking first to the reproductive system, um, of course, the uterus is now evacuated. Um, hopefully all of the contents that were contained in the uterus are now out. That includes um, the placenta, amniotic membranes, the fetus, the amniotic fluid. Um, and so hopefully all of that has come out. Um, it is normal for her to experience um, feelings of contractions even after she delivers the placenta and this is going to help her uterus shrink back to a pre-pregnancy size. We call this process involution where that uterus that once was a pelvic organ now an abdominal organ needs to move back to the pelvis and become once again a pelvic organ. Uh, the lochia, the, the bloody discharge that we have after delivery, is going to be um, termed in, using three terms, uh, rubra, serosa, and alba, and we'll talk about that. The cervix will um, close back up after delivery. Um, the vagina will um, go back to its uh, normal size. Of course, during delivery, it's been stretched quite a bit to accommodate that baby coming through it. And now it's going to need to go back to its normal state. Her breasts are gonna become engorged with milk. That is a process that happens um, as soon as the placenta delivers. Um, the breasts are prepared, they've been preparing for lactation through the whole pregnancy. And so now that that placenta is out, it enables her body to go ahead and um, let milk come down. The perineum could be um, a little uh, traumatic looking, uh, depending on 
what happened during delivery, if there was a need for an episiotomy, or if there were lacerations that happened, if those were repaired or not. And so we'll need to make assessments on the perineum. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the RITA assessment. It's an acronym that will kind of help you remember the things that we look for when it comes to that. Um, a lot of times our care involves giving ice packs to the perineum to help with swelling and pain. Also, we can use topical and systemic medications, so things like Dermaplast spray and then Tylenol, Motrin are the most common medications we give. And then um, if her pain is severe enough, we can either do Norco or um, um, like a Roxy. Um, Eventually, ovulation and menstruation will return. If she's not breastfeeding, that could happen as early as six to eight weeks after she delivers. Usually, though, when she's breastfeeding, um, the return of ovulation and menstruation is more delayed. So it's, um, it kind of is different for each person. Sometimes it can be three months, six months. It just kind of depends on the person. So like I mentioned, involution of the uterus is the uterus's ability to return to its pre-pregnancy size, moving out of the abdominal cavity back to the pelvic cavity. This process takes about five to six weeks, so it doesn't happen all at once, but it will continue to move back down uh, slowly. Um, it usually descends about one centimeter per day. So right at delivery, usually uh, the fundus, the top of the uterus, is going to be level with her umbilicus. Um, it should be, feel like a firm mass, kind of like a, a grapefruit. If you could palpate a grapefruit in somebody's abdomen, that's kind of what the uterus feels like after they deliver. Um, and it's important to keep her bladder empty so that it doesn't inhibit this involution process. Um, sometimes a full bladder can um, prevent that uterus from contracting well and from moving down into her pelvic cavity. So this process of involution is um, necessary to help with the bleeding that people experience after they have a baby. So if you picture the inside of the uterus um, and where that placenta was attached to it, you have a bunch of little blood vessels that um, continue to kind of ooze because they haven't clotted off yet. Um, and when that uterus contracts and it's it's trying to shrink back to its pre-pregnancy size, the muscle fibers of the uterus actually almost ligate those vessels so that it helps them stop bleeding. That's why it's really important for that uterus to contract after somebody has a baby um, so that they might experience contraction like pain. That's a good thing because that means that it's her body's way of trying to prevent itself from bleeding. And it does that by kind of ligating the blood vessels with the muscle fibers of the uterus. So it kind of contracts on itself and it prevents a lot of excess bleeding. That picture on the upper right is how we massage a fundus um, after somebody delivers, making sure that it's nice and firm, should feel like a big firm mass, um, and it should be level with the umbilicus. Um, if it ever feels soft or not well contracted, we call that boggy, and that typically is synonymous with uh, heavy bleeding after delivery. And so we do a lot of massaging of that uterus to help it stay contracted and help decrease the amount of bleeding that somebody experiences after delivery. So here's the term, the acronym RETA, R-E-E-D-A. It stands for redness, edema, ecchymosis, discharge, and approximation. And that's what we're going to try to assess the perineum when we do our assessments. So making sure um, that we know redness, if there's any swelling, any bruising, um, what type of discharge she has, and if there was a repair done, um, are those edges approximated? Now these pictures are... Um, perineums that are very torn up. Um, you can tell there's a hematoma. You can see both pictures have a hematoma. So this is, this is not normal, but it is something that we see. When we talk about lochia, that's the discharge that comes out of the vagina after delivery. And like I mentioned, there are three terms that we use to describe how lochia appears. Um, the first word that we describe lochia as rubra 
and that's usually going to last for about three to four postpartum days. That's where the discharge is kind of dark um, red, um, just a lot of blood, a lot of um, just extra, maybe little bits of clots will come out as well. Um, and then after a couple of days, it progresses to lochia serosa. And this is when the bleeding is getting lighter. It, it's mixed more with serous fluid. Um, so it's more pink tinged, just not as dark as rubra. And then we move into lochia alba, which can last up to six weeks. And that's where it's changing from that lochia serosa, that pink color to more of a yellowish color on back to just a regular clear discharge. It's really important that we quantify um, how much bleeding that she's having. So if she is soaking a pad in less than an hour, we would call that a large amount of bleeding. Um, you can see moderate would be maybe like two thirds of a pad. Uh, small amount would be a third and scant would just be a spot. As I mentioned, her breasts have been preparing for lactation since the beginning of her pregnancy. But once that placenta is expelled, uh, it causes her breasts to really begin to prepare for engorgement and um, lactation. Um, so the first couple of days of postpartum, there's really not a big change in her uh, breasts. They are fuller, but still soft. Usually her milk will come in on about day three, day two to three. Um, and that's where the breasts become engorged. They could become very firm, sometimes lumpy, and that's due to increased blood flow and milk production. Um, engorged breasts occur in both nursing and non-nursing mothers. Um, if she continues to nurse, um, this will be a process. Her breasts will continue to fill with milk. Um, if she is not breastfeeding, we want to bind her breasts um, with um, either a very supportive bra or uh, maybe even an ace wrap um, and have very stimulation to her breasts and that will help her milk to dry up. The nipples should be assessed for redness and cracking. Um, we encourage our patients just to use plain water when washing their, their body, their, especially their breast area, um, just to avoid any soaps that might cause excess drying. Um, we do recommend a supportive bra as um, they are going to be heavier and fuller with milk. Um, and until uh, baby has a good latch, it can cause her some soreness of nipples to happen. So we want to make sure that we're really helping her baby achieve that good latch so that we can prevent any redness or cracking and possibly even later infection um, from damaged nipples. Now we're gonna focus a little bit on the cardiovascular system. So remember when we talked about the changes that happen when somebody gets pregnant, we talked about how the blood volume increases greatly. Um, well now all of that extra blood volume needs to leave the body. And the way she's gonna do that is through a lot of urinary output. Um, sometimes sweating and crying will also help eliminate the excess fluid. Now remember she has lost some blood with her delivery and that's normal and to be expected, but we want to make sure that that doesn't become a problem. Um, and the way that the body kind of helps prepare for that is being hypercoagulable. Remember we talked about that um, in our first couple of weeks um, where she's um, more likely to clot. And that's again, a protective mechanism for pregnancy that um, prevents the woman from losing too much blood when she delivers. Now, hopefully her blood values will return to normal within about six to eight weeks. Um, a lot of times women will experience um, shaking, um, not necessarily because they're feverish or because they're cold. Um, it's just related to the pressure that's been placed on the pelvic nerves. It's a vasomotor response that really is kind of uncontrollable and it will just kind of happen. It's very normal. A lot of people experience it um, and there's not much to do about it. Um, just reassure them that it's normal and that it will go away. Orthostatic hypotension is very common, so we want to make sure our patients uh, change their position very slowly. We usually start off with having our patients dangle at the bedside for a couple minutes. 
um, and then stand up slowly and see if they tolerate that. And then if they feel stable on their feet and not dizzy, then we'll have them take a few steps towards usually the restroom. Um, we'll do our head to toe assessment and vital signs just as we would any other patient. As far as the urinary system goes, I mentioned that a full bladder can impede the uterus from involuting. And so it's important to make sure that she um, empties her bladder frequently, usually uh, no more than two hours. We want them to, to try to empty their bladder at least every couple hours so that um, it doesn't prevent that uterus from um, contracting and staying nice and firm. Um, we want to encourage her to um, make sure she's emptying her bladder completely because if there's any residual urine left in her bladder, there's a higher risk for infection to develop. Um, so we want to try to avoid that. Usually that first void after delivery can be a little scary, especially if they've had any trauma to their perineum. Um, if they've had sutures, it could um, have some burning, stinging, just kind of depends on what state her perineum is in. Um, but we want to do what we can to help her. So providing privacy, not rushing her. Um, sometimes running water in the sink will help her to kind of relax and prepare to urinate. Um, placing her hands in warm water has been known to help. Um, and then using a peri bottle to squirt warm water over her perineum also can help. Um, sometimes women can have a fear about releasing urine and sometimes um, the ability to release urine is kind of impeded from uh, the epidural anesthesia that she may have received um, back when she was in labor. And so just kind of getting everything back awake and working again could take a little bit more time. As far as her GI system goes, she's a little bit more prone to constipation. So we want to make sure that she increases her fluid and fiber intake and that she gets out of bed as much as possible. Um, activity like walking will really help her do that. So we don't like women who've just delivered to just stay in bed. We like them to be up and about and moving. And if they have pain, then we need to help them treat that pain, but we don't want them to have pain to the point where they feel like they can't get out of bed. Hemorrhoids are very common. Um, we'll need to assess for that and treat that um, if they are present. Hemorrhoids um, tend to uh, be very common um, after women have pushed for a long time during labor and delivery. As far as the integumentary system goes, we talked about how uh, they could have hyperpigmentation of the skin. Um, that will go back to normal and fade as they um, finish out their postpartum period. That linea nigra disappears and their stretch marks will slowly begin to fade and lighten. Um, it does take um, quite a while for the skin to get back to its normal state after it's been stretched out during the pregnancy. Um, takes time for the muscles to heal back if they've separated. Um, so this usually, this process usually takes about six weeks for everything to get back to its normal state. As far as the musculoskeletal system, we talked a little bit already about sometimes the, uh, the abdominal muscles can separate during pregnancy. Um, there's some exercises that she can do that will help strengthen those muscles. That would include um, abdominal muscle tightening, head lift, pelvic tilt, and Kegel exercises. As far as the immune system goes, um, this is the time when we will want to give her that rubella vaccine if she is not immune to rubella. Remember we said we don't want to ever give rubella to a pregnant woman because it can cause birth defects in her baby. So if um, she is not immune to rubella, the safest time to vaccinate her would be right after she delivers because she's most likely not going to be having sexual intercourse in the next four to five weeks. And so we want them to wait at least a month, um, if not longer between um, getting pregnant and so after having the rubella vaccine. So it's usually a pretty safe time that we know they're not going to get pregnant um, if right after they deliver, if we give them that rubella vaccine. 
We will also give our RH negative patients a shot of Rogam if they've had an RH positive baby, and that will help prevent those antibodies from forming. For our patients that have delivered via cesarean delivery, um, pretty much it'll be a lot of the same assessments, um, but we'll also include her dressing um, over her incision. Now, sometimes um, today um, doctors are using the Dermabond glue instead. Um, so there may or may not be a dressing, but you'll still need to assess the incision site if um, there's no dressing there. Um, she may have a urinary catheter a little bit longer than somebody who's delivered vaginally. Usually if they've delivered vaginally, we take the catheter out when she's pushing. Um, C-section moms usually will have a little less lochia than vaginal delivery moms um, because the surgeons are able to kind of clean out the uterus a little bit better than with a vaginal delivery. We want to prevent thromb thromb thrombophobitis, so we want to encourage our patients to move, to get out of bed, to walk around um, as soon as possible, and of course medicate for pain as needed. There's a lot of emotions wrapped up in a delivery, um, and it just kind of depends on your particular patient and the state she's in and her partner and what's going on with them. Um, but just being sensitive to the fact that this is a major life change. There's a lot of stresses involved with it and a lot of body changes that take place that add to that. Uh, and so <coughs> our new parents may be um, exhausted, um, which can just kind of exacerbate some of the emotions that they feel. So just being sensitive to our patients and what they need and what we can help with will benefit them. Um, so there are some phases that um, have been identified in the postpartum period. Um, they involve taking in, taking hold, and letting go. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about those and then we're gonna talk about um, some of the normal baby blues and postpartum depression that can happen after delivery. So first of all, taking in, um, this is when, she's right after delivery, when she's kind of just kind of shock, in a state of shock maybe, um, a little bit more passive, kind of exhausted, just kind of um, taking in what just happened, what her body just did. Um, so she's more willing to let others do things for her. Um, not a real great time to do a lot of educating. We just kind of need to let her um, just kind of absorb what happened, um, meet her primary needs of food, fluid, and sleep, and then we can move on um, with education in some of the next phases. The next phase is taking hold, and that's where she becomes a lot more interested in caring for her infant. Um, this is after she's had a little bit of time to kind of process what just happened. Um, it's a time when she usually is going to feel unsure of herself and her abilities, but she's going to be interested in learning. And so this is a great time for us to include her in care and teaching what to expect when she goes home and letting her participate in caring for her infant. The next phase is letting go. Um, and that's where you kind of have to reconcile how life is going to be different. Um, I think sometimes people have this um, idea in their, their brains about how things might be, um, and then reality hits, and it might, be, it might look a little different than what they thought it was going to be. And so, um, you know, it may have started with the fact that maybe their delivery didn't go as expected. Maybe it did. Um, but just kind of working through some of the expectations that they had and maybe what is more realistic. Um, that brings us to our next topic about postpartum blues. Um, postpartum blues are very common. About 70% of women experience this. It usually starts a few days after she's delivered and it can last up for about 10 days, maybe two weeks at its um, furthest point out. Um, it's characterized by tearfulness, insomnia, lack of appetite, and a feeling of <coughs> being disappointed or maybe just overwhelmed. And this is very normal. Like we said, a lot of women do experience this. Um, they're adjusting to caring for this human being, trying to care for themselves. 
Um, and it's just, um, it can be really exhausting and overwhelming all at the same time. So um, very normal, but it is transient in that it doesn't last very long. Um, if she does start to feel like it's kind of going beyond those first two weeks, then we try, we tend to call that transitioning into postpartum depression. Um, and then that might include symptoms such as weight loss, sleeplessness, and ambivalence. Uh, women who are at high risk for going on to developing postpartum depression um, might have an unstable or abusive family environment. Maybe they've had a previous experience with a depressive episode. Um, they might have a limited support system or maybe no support system. Um, they might have low self-esteem or dissatisfaction with kind of their state of life, whether that be with education, economics, or their partner. Um, so we really wanna encourage women who are um, dealing with postpartum depression to speak with their physicians and uh, just really um, get help. Um, don't try to hide it, don't be embarrassed by it, um, but we wanna make sure that they get the help that they need. And maybe all it is is just kind of you know, this being on the radar of their provider and checking back with them in a couple weeks. Sometimes it involves medication. Sometimes it involves counseling. Um, so it's going to be different for each person. And um, we just want to make sure that her needs are being met. I know postpartum psychosis is not uh, necessarily a topic in this chapter. And the reason I put it in here is um, just to give you a little heads up. We will talk about it next week in more detail. Um, but I put it in here because it kind of goes along with um, talking about postpartum blues and postpartum depression. So I just wanted to just toss it out here. You won't be tested on postpartum psychosis next week. Um, but just, just so you know, so, so you have a heads up and you can kind of see the progression. Um, postpartum psychosis is a very... Um, serious problem, very serious disease. Um, sometimes the patients will start out with early signs of depression, um, or it may start abruptly within the first three weeks after birth. It is characterized by confusion, restlessness, high levels of anxiety, and sometimes suicidal thoughts or sometimes homicidal thoughts. Um, sometimes they will express delusional thoughts, like they see people or they see things or they're talking to somebody who's not there. Um, and this is really um, a crisis. So women experiencing postpartum psychosis absolutely need to be helped. Um, they should not be left alone with their children or their child. Um, and they really do need intervention. So usually this is gonna involve hospitalization and, pos and usually medication. So I just, I, I put it in here because it's kind of moving along that continuum since we started talking about blues that can then transition into depression. And if depression goes on untreated, sometimes it can transition into psychosis. So um, just so that it's on your radar and kind of just kind of flows logically, but we will talk more about this. So what's the nurse's role in all of this? Um, the main thing, like I've been saying this whole time, is to really assess your patient and to meet her where she has her needs. Um, that might come in the form of education. It might come in the form of referrals. Um, maybe it's just allowing her to talk through whatever the situation is, um, whether it be her most perfect delivery she could have ever imagined or maybe things didn't go as expected. Maybe um, you know she has questions about why certain things had to happen. Um, but just validating her and um, giving her reassurance and the education that she needs, um, taking into account her culture, past experiences, um, value system, um, support system, um, just meeting her where she is is going to be uh, the best thing we can do. As far as fathers go, um, dads have four phases of adjustment as well. Um, that includes um, having expectations, confronting reality, creating their own role as a dad, and then reaping the rewards of fatherhood. Other family members might be siblings or grandparents, uh, might be aunts and uncles. It uh, just kind of depends on what the particular support system is going to look like. Um, <clears throat> as far as sibling involvement, it's really going to be age dependent. 
And so you'll really want to um, take cues from the parents as far as how involved they want the siblings to be. Um, it, it'll be good to kind of take assessment of how they've prepared the siblings, what they expect. Um, grandparents as well usually uh, like to be involved in a new baby's life, um, and but you know not all the time. So we should never assume. Um, just make sure you check with your patient first as far as how involved she wants the grandparents to be. We also need to consider grieving parents. I think a lot of people forget that sometimes things don't always go and end in a happy situation. Um, so sometimes there can be loss in this department and that is really hard. Um, that's where we really need to use our good therapeutic communication and sensitivity um, and really um, just helping our patients walk through this time of grief. They do tend to um, move through the stages of grief the same way they would if they had any other loss. So shock and disbelief, anger, guilt, sadness and depression, and a gradual resolution of that sadness. There are lots of programs out there that um, teach us as nurses how to help parents that are grieving. Um, and so it's not just something that I can put on one slide here and expect that you guys would know how to handle that type of situation. Um, as nurses in this department, we go through a lot of training to know how to work with these parents and get them what they need um, and help them through this tough time. So any of you that are parents know that um, having a baby can really change a relationship. Um, it can really affect communication. Um, usually the division of responsibilities can and usually is some source of conflict eventually. Just trying to figure out how to do life with this new human being that you have care of now. Um, doing all the normal things and you know, taking responsibility as an adult um, and being exhausted on top of that um, and being overwhelmed maybe with not really knowing exactly what to do. Um, maybe especially with new parents or first time parents, um, just being overwhelmed with um, kind of everything, the whole situation. Um, it can cause some changes in relationships and it can add a little bit of stress that loss of freedom, realizing that you can't just pick up and go anytime you want can um, cause a couple to feel lonely. And so um, just recognizing that as nurses and being available to our patients um, as they might need some suggestions or um, options down the road. So it really does involve a family care plan. Um, and as nurses, we can offer um, different options available within the community that might be of assistance to our families. So data collection for a family care plan will include all of these. Maybe you can even come up with more. Um, demographic in information, the family composition, their occupations, the cultural group that they belong to, any religious or spiritual affiliations that they might have, um, their developmental tasks, where they are in that, um, any health concerns that might add to how you're going to uh, plan care for them, um, different communication patterns, decision making, family values, socialization, coping patterns, housing, cognitive abilities, their support system, and how they're responding to the care you're offering. Now we're going to move on to the, the baby now. We're going to talk about a little bit more about how babies make that change from intrauterine life to now extrauterine life. And babies move through three phases as well. Um, first phase is a period of reactivity where the babies are really alert and awake. And that's usually going to be, your books say about the first 30 minutes. I personally, in my experience, feel like it's a, the first hour. Um, it's different for each baby, um, but generally speaking, I think they're most awake for about the first 60 minutes. Phase two um, is characterized by a decrease in responsiveness, and that lasts from um, the time they kind of enter this period, this the second phase, 
um, up to, for like another two hours. And then phase three is a second period of reactivity. And um, that can be any time really after birth, after they have this kind of phase two decreased responsiveness. Once they wake up from that, um, it can be um, anywhere from two to maybe even eight or even 12 hours after birth. Um, so it just kind of depends on the baby and how the birth process was, what happened, um, as far as how babies will respond. So phase two is going to involve um, supporting thermal regulation because remember that's still a really big issue. Um, and so we want to prevent them from losing their heat through evapor evaporation, conduction, convection, and radiation. We'll be observing for uh, their bowel and urinary function. So making sure we record their first void and their first stool. Uh, we want to make sure that we have safety measures in place um, so that the parents feel safe um, picking up their child. Um, we want to make sure that they know the different security measures available. So um, I know in the hospitals I work at, we're not allowed to carry babies in the hallways. Um, the, if we are transporting a baby from, from one room to another, the baby needs to be in a crib. And that's for the safety um, and security of that baby so that nobody could just take a baby and walk out with it in their arms. Um, that would send up a really big red flag in our department because we just don't allow for that. We want to make sure the infant is properly identified with their um, parents, making sure there's no confusion there. And then we'll go ahead and, and work through um, a head to toe assessment, just taking note of all the particulars that are involved with that. Uh, we'll be observing for any obvious injuries or anomalies. We'll be doing vital signs. We'll be doing weights and measurements. Uh, we'll be showing the, pa the parents how to care for the umbilical cord. Um, and we'll be doing um, different screening tests. Um, as far as hypoglycemia in a newborn, we'll, we're going to use the value of 40 um, for the purpose of test. Keep in mind that it's, it might be different in um, different facilities. Each facility might have its own um, criteria. So um, just for the sake of our class and your test, uh, we'll go with the value of 40. So we will diagnose a baby with hypoglycemia if their blood glucose level is less than 40. Babies that are at risk for hypoglycemia, you could probably remember from our last chapter, we talked a lot about this. Our preterm babies and postterm babies are at higher risk for hypoglycemia. Infants of diabetic mothers are also high risk for hypoglycemia. Our very large for gestational age babies and also our very small for gestational age babies are at higher risk for hypoglycemia. Babies who had intrauterine growth restriction are at higher risk. Um, babies who had a traumatic delivery with low oxygen levels, so we call that asphyxiated, um, those babies have a very high rate of hypoglycemia. Um, our babies who get cold burn up their extra stores of um, brown fat and uh, use their um, blood glucose to do that as well, and that can burn up the glucose that they have, which leads to hypoglycemia. So we, that's why we really try to prevent them from getting too cold. We want to keep them warm, keep them thermoregulated. And also um, mothers who had tocolytics during the labor process are at higher risk for hypoglycemia. Signs of hypoglycemia in the newborn are going to include jitteriness, poor muscle tone, sweating, respiratory difficulty, low temperature, poor suck, high-pitched cry, lethargy, and sometimes seizures. So make sure you know those signs and symptoms. You'll see those again. As far as promoting bonding and attachment, the best way to do that is going to be um, doing skin to skin right after delivery. Um, and it doesn't always have to be with just the mom, although that is the best. Um, it not only benefits the baby, but it also benefits the mom as well and just regulating her hormones and the baby's hormones. Um, so skin to skin with the birth mother is optimal, but if um, mom is not feeling up to it or there's something else going on, absolutely. Um, dads can do skin to skin. Siblings can do skin to skin. Um, so that just helps so much with um, the babies and, and just um, helping them kind of regulate their little systems. Um, it also just 
in providing bonding and attachment, we just try to um, teach the parents um, different signs that the newborn will be showing them and trying to learn how this baby is communicating um, through different cries and sounds and um, things that the baby will do. Like um, maybe when it's hungry, the baby might start rooting where it turns its cheek. Um, it might open its mouth, make sucking noises, it might suck on its fists. Those are all early signs that the baby is hungry. And so when we see that, we can cue the parents in that, that might be time to feed the baby. Um, if the baby is upset, fussy, we might want to have them check the diaper. Uh, a lot of babies don't like um, the feeling of meconium. Um, a lot of babies will get a little fussy when they're trying to pass meconium, um, just that process, they kind of get fussy. And so we can clue the parents into those cues as well. Some ways we can help the bonding process, we can call the infant by name. So even during the labor process, if we know the baby's name, we can speak about the baby by its name. Um, and then once, of course, the baby's here, um, we can speak directly to the baby, um, do skin to skin contact, and just talk in gentle, higher pitched tones. As far as breastfeeding goes, um, it's obviously the patient's decision whether or not they wish to breastfeed their infant or formula feed their infant. Um, we're going to kind of talk over the um, physiology of lactation. So the breasts are under hormonal stimulation, and you remember um, prolactin and oxytocin both help in um, the, the lactation process. Um, the milk itself has um, two different forms. So there's the fore milk and then there's the hind milk. The fore milk is what the baby receives initially in the first five or so minutes of nursing. And then the hind milk is the, a thicker, fattier milk um, that the baby gets um, the longer it nurses. So the remainder 10 to 15 minutes of breastfeeding, the baby will be receiving the hind milk. The fore milk is a little bit um, higher in calories and the hind milk is a little bit higher in um, fat. Um, milk goes through different phases of production. So the very first milk that's being excreted when um, she first delivers is going to be colostrum. Colostrum is a very thick substance. Um, contains lots of antibodies and nutrients. Um, and this is what the baby receives until the milk comes in. Um, so then we have transitional milk uh, when the milk first is coming in. Um, definitely a little bit thinner than colostrum. And then we have the mature milk that will be in um, later on during that lactation process. So babies typically have this um, innate ability to find the breast. Um, if left alone, it's very cute. Um, you can actually see some babies that will crawl from the mother's abdomen up to her chest um, and find the nipple all by themselves with no guidance from anybody. And it's a very sweet process to watch if you ever get that opportunity. There are lots of advantages associated with breastfeeding. Um, these are just a couple, but there's lots. Um, the breastfeeding really helps uh, promote bonding between the mother and the infant. Um, like we said, that whole skin to skin process just kind of helps the transition both for mom and baby. It um, kind of helps even out hormone levels. Um, and of course, breastfeeding is going to pass on some really great antibodies to the baby. Um, it's going to help maintain the baby's skin temperature. So um, just keeping that baby nice and warm next to mom's skin is going to um, help thermoregulate. Um, when the baby sucks at the breasts, that causes um, the mother's body to release oxytocin. And if you remember when we talked about labor, oxytocin is one of the medications that we synthetically make to help her uterus contract when she's in labor. Well, now that she's delivered, we still want that uterus to contract so that she doesn't bleed too much after she delivers. So um, we try to get the babies to breastfeed shortly after they deliver, and that really helps that involution process take place, and it helps keep her bleeding at a minimum.
positions for breastfeeding are going to, there's a few different types here. Um, you see the one on the left, that is called the cradle hold. Um, the one in the middle is the football hold. And the one on the right is a sideline position. There's also a modified cradle hold, which is called a cross cradle, um, which sometimes you see people doing as well. As far as breastfeeding techniques, um, really is uh, the nurse's job to help the mom achieve a good latch with the baby, um, to let her identify the good sounds versus the bad sounds. Um, and we really want to teach her how to remove her baby from her breast as well. So um, allowing the mother to position the baby with one arm and then hold her breast with another and achieve that good deep latch is going to be helpful. Um, we want the, the baby to not really have a lot of sucking noises. Um, if they're making a lot of loud noises or clicking sounds when they're nursing, um, they probably don't have a good latch. So really um, helping the patients understand what a good sound is and what a, what a maybe not so good sound is. And then again, removing the baby from the breast would involve um, sliding one of her fingers into the baby's mouth so that the baby would change its suction from the nipple to her finger and then she can back the baby away from her breast without injuring herself or the nipple. So here's some um, pictures um, about a, a good latch. We really want the babies to take in as much of the areola as possible. So just being on the tip of the nipple is really going to cause a lot of nipple soreness. So really getting the baby to open its mouth up really wide and take in as much of that areola as possible because behind the areola is where the milk ducts are. So we really need the baby to compress those milk ducts in the areola to draw the milk through to the nipple. And we'll have some videos on um, Moodle for you guys to watch as well. And this is just demonstrating removing the baby from the breast like I talked about, sliding that finger in the mouth and then backing the baby away from the breast. It's hard to know how much milk a baby's receiving from breastfeeding. Um, there's a couple different ways that we can kind of have an idea if this baby's getting enough milk. So once the mother's milk comes in, she's going to experience what's called a letdown reflex. Um, if she experiences this letdown reflex, which is like a tingling sensation that um, where milk actually will start dripping from the nipple, that's a good sign that she has enough milk to feed her baby. Baby should nurse for about 15 minutes per breast. Um, eight to 10 times per day. Um, you want to hear them actually swallow. So a lot of times, um, initially when it's just colostrum, they'll probably swallow or suck several times and then swallow versus after the milk has come in, they'll just suck and swallow, suck, swallow, suck, swallow. Um, the infant should appear relaxed after it's feeding and have about six to eight wet, di wet, wet diapers per day once her milk does come in. Until her milk comes in, we want to see at least one wet diaper per day. Um, the infant should pass several stools per day, and the breast should feel soft after feeding. So initially, they'll probably feel firm with milk, and then after the feeding's over, they should feel much softer. And that's another way to know that the baby's received enough. So like we talked about, a poor latch can um, lead to um, nipple soreness, um, cracked, trauma to the nipples. We want to avoid all that if possible. So we really want to um, help our patients know and learn a good latch so that they can avoid any of the nipple trauma that would be associated with poor latches. Sometimes babies, especially the first day, the first 12 to 24 hours, they are very sleepy and they may not want to nurse very much. Um, so we need to make sure that we're at least attempting to get them to feed. And then typically what we see is that those babies who were really sleepy the first 12 to 24 hours will make up for it um, the next 12 to 24 hours. And they usually uh, want to just suck the entire time. So it kind of evens itself out. Um, just because mom has flat or inverted nipples doesn't mean that she's not able to breastfeed. Um, it just 
it takes a little bit more effort in learning and um, teaching the baby as well, but definitely people can breastfeed with flat or inverted nipples. Um, we try to avoid supplemental feedings if possible. Um, babies don't need anything other than breast milk unless there's a medical problem. Um, so we really need to educate our patients on um, the fact that we really don't need anything else other than breastfeeding. Um, if parents are formula feeding, then we want to teach them the appropriate amounts and times to do that as well. We want to try to avoid nipple confusion in the first probably four to six weeks of breastfeeding. Um, if you've ever seen a, a, a nipple that you would buy and put on a bottle, um, the milk comes out of that nipple very easily. Babies don't have to work very hard to get milk to come out of that type of nipple, but they do have to work a little bit harder to get milk to come out of the breast. So they, like we talked about, they have to compress the milk ducts that are behind the areola and then pull the milk forward through the sucking motion. And what they're doing is they're actually compressing um, the areola, those milk ducts, between their tongue and the roof of their mouth and then drying the milk um, with that sucking motion. So we want to try to um, let them learn that process and get that down well before we introduce an easier nipple um, where they don't have to work as hard. We want to teach our moms about breast engorgement. I know as a new mom and even as a labor and delivery nurse, I didn't really know about breast engorgement. I didn't really realize what that was and I was rather shocked when it happened. Um, but parents, moms especially, need to know that the breasts get very full with milk, um, even to the point where they are hard to the touch. Um, and it can be really uncomfortable. And I, I think sometimes that piece of information might get missed in um, talking to our new moms. And so we need to give, allow them um, some remedies to help with that uncomfortableness. So things like um, hand expression, pumping, or even just a warm shower or warm compresses can help the soreness of engorgement. We talked about breast hygiene, um, where we don't really recommend using a lot of soaps um, on the skin that could possibly dry the breast out. So just using um, clean water will be fine. Um, sometimes we give our patients lanolin cream if they're having um, problems with cracked nipples, it can kind of help a little bit. Um, but really, if if you have a good latch and things are going well, you, you really don't need to use any other creams or anything else. We talked about some of the hunger cues already in the newborn. So that hand to mouth movement, uh, mouth and tongue movement, sucking motions, rooting movements, um, sucking on their fists. Those are all um, hunger cues in the newborn. Um, crying is actually a late sign, so we want to teach our parents to recognize the hunger cues in their babies before they start crying. We do have some uh, special breastfeeding situations. That would include um, parents who've had multiples, uh, if their baby is pre born prematurely, um, if they've had a breast surgery, or if there's going to be some delay in the feedings. So there's some things that we can do um, depending on um, the particular situation. Um, we can offer our help as nurses, um, like with multiple births, we can help her get both babies on at the same time if that's what she wants to do. If she just wants to focus on one at a time, we can help her do that. Um, for premature birth, uh, sometimes those babies don't have a good suck reflex. And so um, we encourage our moms to pump and get that good colostrum out, and then that can be given to their babies just so they're still getting the benefits of the immunity um, from that breast milk. Patients who've had breast surgeries um, doesn't mean that they can't breastfeed. Sometimes it does affect um, the amount of milk they're able to produce. It just depends on the involvement of the milk ducts during the surgery, whether it was augmentation or reduction. Um, so it just depends. We always encourage our patients to try and um, just kind of see how it goes. And then if we need to make adjustments down the road, we can always do that. As far as storing and freezing breast milk, 
Um, this is the part where your book is a little confusing because it talks about different types of freezers. Um, for the purpose of our test um, in this class, there's just some, I'm going to kind of simplify it for you guys so that um, it's hopefully a little bit easier to understand what I'm going to test you guys on. So um, main thing we want to know and make sure we do is that we're not leaving breast milk out for more than four hours because that can cause bacteria to grow and it can cause contamination. So we don't want that to happen. So uh, we want to try to keep breast milk refrigerated if it's not going to be consumed right away. Um, if, say, a parent is pumping, um, we don't want her to pump a whole day's worth or a whole week's worth into one container. Um, it's better to just pump enough for each feeding and have each feeding in its own container. Um, that'll help just with the thawing and the defrosting and the warming. Um, so it just kind of helps, it just keeps it safer, less bacteria to form. Um, and in that way, you know exactly how much you have. As, again, for the purpose of our class, we're going to say that uh, milk can be stored in a refrigerator, just a normal refrigerator for 24 hours. And in a normal freezer that is kind of like the component to the refrigerator, so like the other half of it, um, for up to three months. Now your books go into like a deep freezer and then there's other freezers that um, are a little less reliable than a refrigerator freezer. It gets kind of confusing. So for the purpose of this class and our test, I just want you to know that uh, we're going to go with storing breast milk in a refrigerator for 24 hours and storing breast milk in a freezer for up to three months. Um, when we go to thaw breast milk that's been frozen, the best way to do that is to leave it in the refrigerator 24 hours prior to it being needed. Um, so the whole day before would be great. That way it can defrost naturally and slowly and it won't hurt any of its um, either antimicrobial factors or immunity factors. Um, we never ever want to recommend microwaving breast milk or formula milk. Um, it can destroy the immune factors in the milk and it also heats it irregularly. So you could have some areas where the milk is um, very, very hot and then other areas where the milk is really not hot at all. So it heats it irregularly. And then if we're gonna store uh, breast milk in a freezer, we wanna use glass or hard plastic containers. As far as teaching maternal nutrition, we want to encourage our moms to eat an additional 500 calories over their pre-pregnant diet. So not over their pregnant diet, but their pre-pregnant diet, just to be an additional 500 calories. It's really important that they stay up on their fluid intake, so make sure you recommend them drinking 8 to 10 glasses of fluid per day. Um, also, we need to educate our parents that sometimes the foods that they eat can cause their breast milk to change the taste or even um, cause the infant to have more gas, and that can create a lot of discomfort in the baby. Um, also, keep in mind that medications can be um, passed through in breast milk as well, so it's important that they check with their providers um, and let them know that they are breastfeeding and making sure that that particular medication is going to be safe for the baby. Um, occasionally, certain medications are not safe for babies, and we w might have to recommend that um, she use an alter alternative form of um, feeding temporarily and maybe just pump and dump her breast milk so that the baby's not getting that medication when it comes time to wean the baby from breastfeeding, um, it's best to do it gradually. Um, it's going to be up to the parents as far as when and the best time will be for them. Um, it's recommended that they eliminate one feeding at a time instead of going cold turkey and just up and stopping completely. Um, usually the daytime feedings um, to be admitted are going to be the, the best to start with. Um, and then you'll want to recommend that they eliminate the baby's favorite feeding, whether it be maybe the um, first feeding of the day or the last feeding before they go to bed. Um, those are probably the, 
feedings that they'll want to eliminate last. Um, babies will want to comfort nurse if they're tired or ill. And so parents can do that. They might have to adjust their feeding schedule for that. Um, breastfeeding or breast pumping will only encourage the breast to make more milk. So um, if they are hoping to stop breastfeeding, we would not want to encourage them to continue pumping either. Now we're gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about formula feeding. Um, for our parents that choose to feed their babies formula, there are three different types that they have to choose from. There are ready to feed, concentrated liquids, and powder forms. Um, regardless of which kind they opt to use, it's really important that they follow the directions on the particular formula that they buy because when they reconstitute it, um, they can either over dilute or under dilute and that can be um, problematic for the baby. So it's really important that they follow the instructions explicitly and not try to add more water to dilute it a little bit to get more use out of it, but really stick with the instructions that are on the particular feeding. So our um, ready to feed formulas are gonna be the um, the easiest, the fastest, uh, most convenient. Um, those are just ready to go. You just pop a nipple on and you can feed the baby. Um, it doesn't need to be heated um, and it doesn't take any diluting or anything like that. So those are um, unfortunately the most expensive but the most convenient. Um, the concentrated liquids, uh, you have to dilute. Um, so they're a little bit more expensive. And then the least expensive is gonna be the powdered formula um, that you add water to and mix together. So it just kind of depends on the parent's preference, their economic status, and how important that convenience level is for them. Because when our parents are formula feeding their baby, they're gonna to want to feed that baby about every three to four hours. With breastfeeding, we have to feed a little bit more often because breast milk is more easily digested in babies, whereas formula takes a little bit longer to digest. So they don't have to feed them quite as often. Again, we don't want them microwaving the formula. If they need to warm the formula, then they can uh, run it under warm water. Um, we never want our parents to bottle prop because that can cause the infant to choke. Um, and that's just not safe. So we always want to make sure that the parents are holding the baby um, and that their their eyes are on their baby the whole time. One of the benefits of formula feeding is that other people can um, share in the process of feeding that infant, uh, whereas with breastfeeding, it's only the mom who's able to do that unless she's pumping. Um, so it does give the partner and other family members an opportunity to participate in, in that care as well. As far as discharge planning goes, um, we've always said that our discharge teaching begins upon admission, and, and that's to kind of help disperse the information that we want to communicate to our patients and not overwhelm them right before they are leaving. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have a ton of time to um, teach them while they're there in the hospital. The time that they spend with us, are it's getting less and less all the time. And so um, we wanna just start as soon as they're admitted and um, give them little bits of information along the way so that they're um, able to digest that a little bit easier. As far as postpartum self-care teaching, um, we're gonna wanna teach our patients how to um, take care of themselves, first of all, so things to look for as far as um, too much bleeding or signs of infection, um, other danger signs maybe related to preeclampsia that we still want them to be on the lookout for. Um, we want to make sure that they know how, know that it's important to change their pads frequently to prevent an infection and what too much bleeding might look like. We want to make sure that they're set up for a follow-up appointment in usually four to six weeks, uh, maybe sooner if they had a C-section. Um, if they did have a C-section, we're going to want to give them good instruction on bathing, showering, and their dressing, whether or not they have a dressing or not, and how to care for that. Um, we want to make sure that they know if they need to return for 
staples to be removed or stitches to be removed. Most of the time stitches will just dissolve, um, but occasionally we'll bring them back in for um, a one week follow up to either remove staples or just to have a dressing check. We we'll want to make sure that they understand um, the signs to watch out for in their baby and when to call the provider for that. Uh, we we'll want to make sure that they have a car seat available uh, and that they know how to use it. Um, as nurses, we never get involved in um, uh, teaching how to use a car seat um, just from a safety standpoint, a legal standpoint. Um, we always need to refer them to whichever manufacturer they have for their car seat to the um, instructions that came with it so that they know for sure that they're doing it the right way. Um, we also want to provide uh, phone numbers for the parents to call if they have any problems or if they just need to get advice and talk to somebody. For our babies, um, again, we want to start teaching our parents early on. Um, usually that baby is going to need a follow-up appointment within 48 or 72, well, 24 to 72 hours is um, for most babies. Just kind of depends on the provider and what they recommend and what's going on with the baby. Um, they'll be given information about different immunizations that their baby will be receiving. And then making sure again that, that um, they know that the baby's car seat needs to be in the back seat and rear facing. So that is all for this chapter. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed talking about the family after birth. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll talk to you next week.